Hey everyone, time for another video. Today we'll be taking a look back at the Corto Dual E7400 from Intel. Released in October of 2008, the 2.8GHz Dual Core E7400 is for the LGA775 socket and is based on the Wolfdale 3M architecture featuring 228 million transistors on the 45 nanometer fabrication process. It also has 3 megabytes of L2 cache. It has a 1066MHz frontside bus and features no turbo boosting or hyperthreading whatsoever. It also has a TDP of 65 watts. It initially released at a price of $133, which is $155.41 today, or £117.21, but today can be bought for as little as £1 from CEX in the UK. We'll be testing its stock and overclocked performance in Cinebench R15 and Super Pi 1 million, and also in a few games as well, which are The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt, GTA 5, Rise of the Tomb Raider, and Fortnite Battle Royale. We'll be testing all of our games today at both 1080p and 720p for our stock and overclocked speeds to see if the E7400 is capable of playing some relatively modern games. The system we'll be using today features 8GB of DDR2 RAM at 800MHz, a MSI GTX 1080 Armor OC edition from my personal system, Windows 7 Ultimate 64-bit, and the Fantex TC14PE to keep the CPU cool. To start off with, we're testing the E7400's performance in Cinebench R15, a popular multi-threaded benchmark designed to test your processor's capability of rendering a photorealistic 3D scene. Before overclocking though, we need to get a baseline score at the E7400's stock speed of 2.8GHz to see what kind of improvement is made with an overclock. And at stock, the E7400 managed a score of 146, the best score from a stock clocked CPU I've tested so far on this channel. Overclocking wise, we managed to get a stable overclock of 3.675 GHz, which puts the RAM at 876 MHz before the motherboard stopped recognising the hard drives. At this speed, the E7400 managed a score of 193, an improvement of 32.19% over the stock score. Next up for our test today is SuperPi, a single threaded benchmark designed to calculate Pi to a set amount of decimal places. Today we'll be doing 10 runs of the 1 million preset and taking the fastest time from those 10 runs for both stock and overclocked speed respectively. At the stock 2.8GHz speed, the E7400 managed the fastest time of 18.375 seconds, about 1.2 seconds faster than the E6750 I tested a while ago. Moving on to overclocking, and we used the same 3.675GHz overclock we did previously, which managed to take 4.171 seconds off the previous time with a fastest run of 14.204 seconds. First up for our games today is The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt, a game based on the Witcher series of novels by Polish author Andrzej Sapkowski. At 1080p on the lowest settings possible, the E7400 was the best performer in Witcher 3 I've tested so far, although that's not really saying much given that it was kind of horrible to play. In Villages, the FPS was in the low to high 20s and exhibited some stutter as well, much like the previous processors I've tested, it had the same complete lockups, often lasting several seconds. In the wooded areas, FPS managed to get to around 30 to 50 frames per second, but suffered from occasional dips under 20, with dips under 30 frames per second happening on turning the camera as well, which can make for some difficult combat, although in this run, combat wasn't actually that bad. Unfortunately, though, the severe lockups make this impossible to play. I did however manage to get a 15 minute fraps benchmark, which showed an average of 36 frames per second, with 1% and 0.1% lows of 14 and 8 frames per second respectively. Hoping for at least something resembling a playable game, I moved on to 720p with the lowest settings possible, I know how disappointed I was with what was in front of me. The game actually performed worse than at 1080p, FPS wise it was mostly similar, however the lockups remained and happened more frequently than they did at 1080p. The starter was less regular, which a slightly higher 1% low showed, but benchmark-wise the game averaged 34 frames per second, with 1% and 0.1% lows of 17 and a massive 0 frames per second respectively. Moving on to overclocking, and we used the same 3.675GHz overclock from the previous two benchmarks. At 1080p, on the low settings, there was definitely an improvement, with FPS in the villages jumping to around 25 to 35 frames per second with dips under 20 FPS happening when turning the camera. The lockups still remained, and although happening less frequently, were still equally game-breaking, which made me decide to not run a Fraps benchmark, as the game was still unplayable despite the performance lift. At 720p, the E7400 managed to achieve FPS that was quite playable, with over 30 in the villages and occasional dips under that mark and reaching nearly 70 in less detailed areas. The stutter had mostly gone too, but the lockups, as ever, were still there. 
and like 1080p, I again decided not to run a Fraps benchmark, as the lockups negate any improvement anyway. Next up is Grand Theft Auto 5, which we will be running at 1080p and 720p on the lowest settings we can with sharp shadows. The game follows the lives of Michael, Trevor and Franklin, and is based in the fictional US state of San Andreas, which itself is based on Southern California. 1080p at stock, the E7400 managed around 30 to 40 frames per second out in the desert where Trevor lives, but dipped down into the 20s at times. Venturing into the city caused some pretty jarring gameplay, with occasional lockups lasting a couple of tenths of a second, with some input locking while driving occurring as well. A 15 minute Fraps benchmark showed an average of 34 frames per second, with 1% and 0.1% lows of 15 and 11 frames per second respectively. At 720p, the game didn't really improve at all, with average FPS only 1 frame per second higher at 35. It has the same issues with stuttery gameplay in the city, and issues with the game locking up for a couple of tenths of a second remain too. 1% and 0.1% lows were also identical to 1080p as well, at 15 and 11 frames per second respectively, showing that you may as well run the game at 1080p as it won't make a difference to performance at all. Moving on to our next tests, overclocking did manage to give a decent boost to performance. At 1080p, FPS outside Trevor's house ranged from around 40 to 45 frames per second, and hit almost 60 FPS in other parts of the desert area. The input locking in the city was also gone, and on the journey to the city there was no stutter that I saw at all. Getting into the city however, the game did get quite stuttery. It would be bearable to some people, but certainly not to everyone. Overall it was an enjoyable experience if you can put up with some low FPS and occasional stutter, with an average of 45 frames per second in a Fraps benchmark, and 1% and 0.1% lows of 21 and 15 frames per second respectively. At 720p with an overclock, the game again couldn't improve on 1080p, with performance pretty much the same. 720p exhibited more stutter than at 1080p, and also had the same lockups and input locking issues as at stock. The FPS in the desert area couldn't manage much if anything at all over 40, with dips near 20 and a whole 10 frames per second not tough of what 1080p with an overclock managed outside Trevor's house. A 15 minute Fraps benchmark showed an average of 42 frames per second with 1% and 0.1% lows of 20 and 14 frames per second respectively. Next up, we're moving on to Rise of the Tomb Raider, the sequel to 2013's Tomb Raider, a game in which you play as Lara Croft on a quest to find a divine source, a supposed source of immortality, before an organisation called Trinity get their hands on it first. 1080p didn't really work out that well for the E7400 at stock. The game suffered from minor texture popping at times, and FPS dips into the single figures when turned in camera, and ran at almost slideshow-like frame rates in parts of the Soviet installation. In less detailed areas, however, the game did manage to get into the 40 to 50 FPS range, with no stutter that I saw. There was also an instance of the game completely locking up and the audio repeating over and over again for a few seconds. A 15 minute Fraps benchmark showed an average of 38 frames per second, with 1% and 0.1% lows of 12 and 6 FPS respectively showing that overall, despite some decent performance in parts, the game is mostly unplayable at 1080p. And much like the previous games, the E7400 performed worse at 720p than it managed at 1080p. The FPS in most areas was actually a little bit higher than at 1080p, with the FPS dipping to only the low 10s when turning the camera, and reaching just over 50 FPS in other parts, but the game did unfortunately start quite badly at seemingly random points in time, and performance was still pretty bad throughout the Soviet installation. A 15 minute Fraps benchmark showed an average of 36 frames per second, 1% and 0.1% lows of 10 and 5 frames per second respectively. With an overclock though, at 1080p the game becomes a lot more bearable, albeit still with its issues. The game runs reasonably smooth, although it does still have some stutter throughout, and FPS is in the 35 to 60 FPS range, averaging around the 35 to 45 mark most of the time some occasional dips under 30. There's still some stutter throughout the Soviet installation, but fortunately it isn't as bad as previously, and in my opinion, doesn't happen often enough to make the game completely unplayable. You just have to put up with some bad stutter at points. A Fraps benchmark showed an average of 47 frames per second, with 1% and 0.1% lows of 17 and 8 frames per second respectively. 720p is a little worse off than 1080p, but in a way you could also say it was better. With FPS generally lower throughout gameplay, but with a higher FPS figure at points than 1080p could manage. There's more stutter throughout than 1080p, but in the Soviet installation, 720p stutters less than 1080 did. FPS dips near 20 at points, and the game locks up for a few tenths of a second, whereas 1080p didn't. 
Across a 15 minute fraps benchmark, the game showed an average of 48 frames per second, with 1% and 0.1% lows of 19 and 13 frames per second respectively. Lastly for our games today, it's Fortnite Battle Royale, a game in which you fight with up to 99 other players in a battle to the death, or in a team against a number of other teams. It's still technically an early access game, so performance won't be perfect yet, but due to its more simplistic graphics, Fortnite tends to perform pretty well on older or lower end hardware. At 1080p, I managed to run it at high with post-processing on low to get a reasonable playable experience. In the pre-match holding area, FPS was in the range of 35 to over 40 frames per second, with some minor stutter at points. In the battle bus, performance was pretty good too, with FPS reaching over 60, but unfortunately it cut pretty much in half when people started diving and exhibited some fairly noticeable stutter and dips near 20 frames per second, which is okay in this game though, considering that gameplay on the ground is what matters the most, although if this would bother you, turning down the settings would help greatly. Once on the ground though, gameplay was reasonably enjoyable, hitting the high 50s and mostly staying above 40 with some minor, almost unnoticeable stutter. A 15 minute fraps benchmark showed an average of 57 frames per second, with 1% and 0.1% lows of 24 and 14 frames per second respectively. I did test the game at 720p as well, but won't be including the tests in this video, because I personally don't think that that matters as 1080p performance is pretty good anyway, with some tweaking in the graphic settings being all that is needed to gain more performance if you'd prefer. Overclocking didn't have too much of an impact performance wise, but it definitely did help. At 1080p, in the pre-match holding area, the FPS did manage to get over 50 at points, but was fairly similar to the figures achieved at stock. FPS when diving improved slightly too, ranging between 30 FPS to around 45, but with some minor dips underneath the 30 mark. On the ground is where most of the improvement happened, with gameplay being really smooth and having no star that I saw, and FPS figures constantly over 60, occasionally hitting over 80 frames per second at times. A 15 minute fraps benchmark showed an average of 66 frames per second, with 1% and 0.1% lows of 24 and 12 frames per second respectively. You won't actually notice the star once on the ground though, despite what the 0.1% low might show. Again, I won't bother including the 720p test as performance at 1080p at high with low post processing could be improved by lowering the settings a bit to achieve a better experience than I did. Overall, it was kind of frustrating in a way that performance didn't improve at all with 720p over 1080p, but in fact was worse than the higher resolution. I also wasn't expecting the motherboard to limit my overclocking so much, as I've gone higher than the 1400MHz frontside bus speed that I needed to use to get 3.675GHz, without having any problems with the hard drives being detected. Although, with a better motherboard, you'd obviously fare better in that department. The E7400 is pretty much a no-go as far as The Witcher 3 goes, the same being true for GTA 5 and Rise of the Tomb Raider at stock. Fortnite though runs reasonably well enough to be playable on the E7400 at stock, or with an overclock, but overclocking can't save The Witcher 3 unfortunately, nor will it transform Rise of the Tomb Raider either. GTA 5 on the other hand is okay with an overclock, but some will probably find the issues a bit too much. If you liked this video, please consider sharing it and leaving a comment or a like for more content like this. Hopefully you'll tune in for the next one.